Good morning and welcome to our In Disputes session for this year. In Disputes is our, our programme to look at a specific area of litigation uh, in some detail. And this year we're looking at the question of risk in litigation. Uh, we have produced two videos to go uh, with this session. Uh, one which looks at assessing the risk and the other which looks at managing the risk. And we will be launching those videos this week but we will be including some sneak previews of those videos uh, in this session today. We have a fantastic panel uh, today, which we uh, will use to go through uh, this session. But before that, I've got to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, for those people online. Um, you have uh, on your console, uh, uh, which is interactive, you can move and resize your windows around the desktop. Uh, and there are tools such as Q&A uh, and resources uh, available to you. Uh, we want to keep today as dynamic and interactive as possible and we will hear from our panel and then we'll take some questions. Uh, if you have tuned in online you can send us questions uh, which uh, we will uh, hope to get to but if not we'll get back to you um, after the session. Um, this event is being recorded uh, and there's an on-demand link so not only can you watch our videos after this session but you can re-watch this session as well. A, a real treat. Um, I'm just going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, on my right, I've got David Bridge. He's a partner in the litigation team uh, at CMS. Uh, then next to him, I've got Harshi Thakura. He's the Chief Investment Officer of Assertis. Uh, they are funders and purchasers of litigation. So for them, uh, assessment of risk in litigation is of high importance. To my left, I've got Ed Yell. He's the Head of Scheme Underwriting at Litica, who are insurance agents and can, uh, for whom also uh, risk is important, but can also talk about some of the products in the insurance market that can mitigate against risk. Next, I've got uh, Louise Boswell, who's another partner in the litigation team at CMS. And on my far left, I've got Andy Hobbs, uh, who's the Chief Operating Officer uh, and Performance Psychologist at Assurity. Uh, and he helps with witness familiarization litigation. Witnesses are uh, obviously a principal risk area uh, in terms of the outcome of litigation, and he can insist in informing us about how you go about uh, trying to assess and minimise the risk in terms of witnesses. So that's our panel today. Um, we're going to start off by just asking the most basic question of what role does the risk play in litigation? And I'm going to start with a clip from one of our videos. Litigation is... Litigation is inherently risky and the most obvious risk is uncertainty in relation to the outcome of the overall case should it go to trial and should you get a final and binding judgment. And in that context one often thinks of one party winning, another party losing, but litigation is usually a non-zero-sum game. So that means one party's gains won't necessarily be matched or reflected in the other party's losses and it's much more nuanced than that. So you need to take into account a range of risks in assessing your strategy. One approach is to focus uh, purely on risk in relation to the legal arguments, perhaps getting an opinion on the merits of success in relation to those arguments, either as part of an early case assessment or perhaps a little bit later uh, with the involvement of counsel. But that's not you know, the only risk. There are plenty of other risks, including risk in relation to uh, documents, uh, witnesses, uh, also, um, understanding that just because somebody says that there's a percentage prospect of success, you're not necessarily going to find out the answer as to whether you're right or not until the end of the case, which is many years later, after the costs and time that's been expended. So it's a much more uh, nuanced approach and needs some careful thought and consideration. David, that was you. Um... The, uh, what's the correct way? Well, litigation is many things. It's uh, complex legal arguments, it can be a strategic game, uh, it can be uh, an attempt to achieve some specific outcome. But what's the correct way to think of it in terms of risk? Um, I think it's important to think of it obviously in the round. There's a whole range of risks to be considered. And as I said in that video, litigation is inherently risky because even the strongest of legal cases carries with it a degree of risk. And actually, if there wasn't any risk at all, um, you'd be in a slightly strange scenario where the outcome would always be certain. Um, everyone would know that at the outcome. And hypothetically, uh, there wouldn't be many disputes, I'd suspect, because most parties would end up agreeing with each other and the party in the wrong would acknowledge that and everybody would move on. But that's you know, totally unrealistic 
way of looking at things. And for the most complicated of disputes, you've got to look at a range of risk factors. So you've got to look at not just legal risk, but also risk in relation to things like the people concerned. Um, so who's going to be potentially a witness of fact? What are those facts going to say? How will they perform under pressure? Are they going to be credible in the eyes of a judge if it comes to it? And then you've also got to think about things like documents. So how do you get your handle on you know, the key documents in the case at an early stage to inform um, your approach to you know, resolving the dispute? And then there's uncertainty like you know, the parties you're dealing with, the unpredictable nature of the other side, their interests, their competing settlement strategies, as well as things like the judge. So if you get to trial, you know, the decision is out of your hands at that stage. And even if you win and you get a judgment in your favour, you've then got, of course, an enforcement-related risk because there's no point pursuing a claim if ultimately the judgment debtor can't pay. So you need to factor all of those things into account at an early stage, and that informs the approach you take. And Harshif, you're a funder and a purchaser of litigation. Uh, you must see litigation as essentially just a kind of a... A, 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 a throw of the dice, a risk game. How do you go about assessing uh, risk and what's your attitude to risk in litigation? Sure, so uh, of course there is an element of throwing the dice in any piece of um, uh, litigation or any dispute. Um, it's, it's adversarial by its, by its nature, so there's always going to be t t t to some degree a winner and a loser. Mm. Analyzing that risk is, is everything that we do. It's what we uh, attempt to do early on and we try to look at where key inflection points might be in litigation, um, where there might be uh, settlement prospects, even though we think that risk of actual uh, winning may be higher or, or, or lower than, than uh, the claimant may think at trial. And we also have to consider all the other factors that, uh, that, that factor into whether a dispute can be successfully resolved um, uh, by way of a court hearing or, or other settlement, such as uh, uh, witness evidence, as David mentioned, um, uh, the, the reputational damage, the, the cash required to get all the way to the end of trial, the, the propensity to settle of the other side, if it's an existential threat to their business or not. There's all sorts of manner of different risks that enter into the mind of a claimant and a defendant. And us as a funder, we have to be able to assess those risks and assess whether our investment is going to enable the claimant to be able to better resolve that risk or whether we think that we're actually going to um, uh, perhaps even impinge on the prospects of resolving that risk because our funding might be too expensive. So there are a number of factors that come into play when we're assessing risk um, and uh, we, we take into account at least a dozen, probably more touch points at the start of any assessment of litigation to decide whether we should invest in that risk with the claimant, with the law firm or not. So it's a pretty ruthless analysis of risk, the way you go, you, you go about it. It's it, very thorough. Necessarily so. It, it, yeah. it has to be early on because we're investing hard cash into a claim, whether we're funding or purchasing. Um, we are uh, we're, we, we're, we're completely non-recourse finance. So in the event that we lose the claim or we don't manage to settle the claim or we think the prospects are sufficiently low that we should not continue with the claim, our investment is completely lost. So we have to be fairly uh, candid with our assessment of risk up front with the claimant, with the law firm. Um, and often we see uh, claims which might, on the on the face of it, have very good prospects of success, not be able to be funded due to uh, other factors that impinge on uh, the assessment of risk, such as what I mentioned, economics and uh, reputation that might well really um, underpin the entire piece of piece of litigation. Yeah, and uh, Andy, from an insurance point of view, how do you see the role of risk in litigation? Um, it's a very similar position to um, to Harshiv, in as much as we're being asked to get involved in litigation at a very early stage mm. and to take an assessment on the merits of a particular case really at a very early part. So often we will be approached before we've even seen the defence from the defendant mm. in the litigation. So it's using whatever resources are available at that very early stage in the litigation to make an assessment about whether it's an insurable risk. And again, the risk we face is very similar to hardship in as much as we will put in place an insurance policy which says in the event that your claim is unsuccessful and you're ordered to pay the cost of the litigation, we will cover those costs. And those policies can be enormous. So it's, it's using whatever resources are available. And um, also, I think the other point which, which we look at is often to look at the settlement dynamics, which is the same as the funders, to see whether, regardless of the legal merits, what is the likely sort of psychology of the litigation? Are we going to face really dug in defendants? who are not going to settle it for reputational reasons or not going to settle it because they just, you know, competitor who's litigating against them. 
So what we're always looking to achieve is, is uh, uh, an opportunity where there is a, a realistic prospect of an outcome because the closer we get to trial, the, closer, the, the greater our risk is. And certainly our experience over, over the last years has been that once you're at trial, unfortunately, the form book rather goes out the window. Mm. You know, it becomes a bit of a, you know, a toss mm. of a coin. And so if we can avoid trial, we will always avoid trial. That's very interesting. Um, and in terms of um, how well lawyers do, in assessing risk. Risk is obviously very important. Assessment of risk is very important. Louise, how well do lawyers do generally in assessing and apprising clients of the genuine risk in litigation at the outset? Well, I mean, I think to Ed's point, it, it kind of depends on the resources available. Um, and obviously that changes throughout the history of a case. So one of the things that I think it's important for lawyers and, and funders and insurers um, to do is to keep that risk under review during the life of the case, because actually your assessment of that risk might change during the course of you know, disclosure, of, of, of proofing your witnesses, of actually then the witness, um, it, witness evidence being exchanged. So I think there are lots of different touch points at which you would look to assess that risk in terms of how well we do it. That's, you know, that's why we're here today to discuss that because I was, gonna, I was just talking to, to amongst um, us before the session and actually uh, clients often ask lawyers, can you give me a percentage prospects of success? But in reality, that's quite a blunt tool because it depends on what data you've used to come up with that percentage. Um, and whilst there are certain things that, of course, you can um, objectively quantify that can feed into that percentage, there are other things that are simply very uncertain and that at the outset of a case in particular, you just won't know. Um, there might be um, an assessment, as, as David mentioned at the start, that you can make about the legal uncertainties of the case. Um, you might obtain a, a counsel's opinion that help you with that. But there are other things such as the, the nature of the documents, what evidence is going to be made available in support of your legal analysis that you might just might not know at the outset. Uh, do you think uh, lawyers are good enough at giving you advice on risk? Mm -hmm. uh, CMS certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, everybody else. Um, I think that uh, I think it's a very good point. There's a, obviously there's a little bit of tension um, about when do you go out and get counsel's opinion. Because we probably get presented with, I don't know what the exact number is, but 50 council's opinions a month, say. And every single one of those will say that the case has a 60% prospect of success. <laughs> and obviously, we don't insure every one of those cases. Um, and the, the great problem we have from an underwriting perspective is those opinions of, 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 are often very heavily caveated. So we'll have an opinion from the finest QC and KC in the land Mm. saying that uh, the case has a 70% prospect of success, but they haven't had an opportunity to look at the document or they haven't had an opportunity mm. to speak to the witnesses. And so the, the value of that as a document is, is somewhat limited. I understand there is a sort of client solicit attention though, because obviously how much work are you going to do in preparation for a piece of litigation even before the gun has, 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 has sounded? Um, and so there is that, that push and pull. Um, I think that um, things have moved on slightly. I think people are better assessing risk now. There are lots of different um, uh, service providers out there who can provide complementary services. So often looking at the potential valuation of a claim before that claim's commenced, at least getting a, a, a better idea rather than shooting completely blind. Um, and I think people are improving, but yes, I would say there's still some work to do and just having an opinion saying 60% isn't the answer to, you know, the question. And Harshay, if you have a very sophisticated analysis of risk on your side, do you think the lawyer's input matches your own sophistication of that? Could they do better? Um, I mean, the lawyer's input's really only one aspect of, mm. uh, of, of whether we take on a funded claim or not, i.e. Uh, we, we get to a binary go, no go. Um, and the assessment of risk by lawyers generally, uh, entirely agree with Ed, has significantly improved in the last few years. Um, I, th I think I entirely agree with Louise as well that percentage points are a blunt instrument. I mean, being frank, you know, you, you, you will get an opinion which says the overall claim has 70% prospects of success, but there's a 50-50 chance that you may fail on an early application for X, Y, Z. Um, but the remainder of the claim has prospects of 70%. I mean, the math just doesn't go. That, 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 can't, that can't equate. But we have to mitigate that by, by, by gateways or conditions within the funding arrangement to, to, allow, to allow us to get to that uh, binary go or no go stage in terms of funding. Um, I think that, that lawyers are certainly becoming a lot more attuned to what the requirements of insurers and funders are in terms of overall prospects and therefore if frankly a claimant approaches a lawyer that doesn't have the means to take a claim all the way to, to, 
to um, uh, to trial or, or even to part way through a litigation process, then lawyers uh, are becoming a lot more adept at being able to assess that risk to war- to to be able to warrant their own time in taking the claim forward for funding and insurance. So that's certainly helping the market in terms of the assessment of risk going forward. I still think there's a long way to go. Um, I think that that. Uh, that w- that sixty percent threshold that Ed mentioned is exactly what we see. We see dozens of opinions all the time, and we, they all have sixty or sixty-five percent prospects of success, often heavily caveated, and mm-hmm. and that's uh, likely the same opinions we're seeing, of course. So I think that will certainly change, and we'll um, we'll we'll get a lot more sophistication with certain counsel and certain lawyers who are seeing claims for funding all the time, and are therefore becoming a lot more comfortable with assessing risk. And of course. Um, funders and insurers go to counsel directly or, or lawyers directly to assess risk and therefore that process will feed into their ability to advise clients as well. Thank you for that. The, um, of course risk in litigation doesn't sit in a vacuum. It can arise, it must arise from specific uncertain factors within the litigation and we're just going to go through some of those uh, where the uncertainty arises from. We're going to start off with looking at witnesses. Uh, we're just going to play a further little clip from one of our videos. Certainly when you think of a big trial, you think of the witness in the stand before the court being cross-examined by a very clever barrister who trips them up about something and then there are gasps from the audience um, that this has been revealed. In reality, witness evidence often plays a very different role to that and we shouldn't get it out of perspective, but for factual disputes it can be very important to the analysis of risk. In order to look at the risks associated with witnesses, I would start by looking at the scope of the witness evidence that's actually needed. It can be very tempting to think that you need evidence on every single issue, but in fact, you really only need evidence on the issues which are factual and in dispute. So there may be many factual issues which can be perfectly easily settled through documents. And similarly, there may be many, many legal issues which don't need to come within the purview of witnesses at all. And so once you've then established that scope of the witness evidence, you can think about who are the individuals who would be able to speak to those issues. Obviously it doesn't need to be one individual for all of them, it might be split between a number of individuals. So what's your potential pool of individuals available to do that? Um, and how credible and likeable are the individuals who fall within that pool. Human nature is such that the extent to which you like or dislike somebody is likely to impact on how credible you think you are and unfortunately judges are not immune to that sort of analysis in terms of reaching a conclusion as to who is the witness that is most credible and whose case should be successful as a result of that. So not all cases uh, turn on witness evidence. Uh, some cases may just be based on, on documents. Some cases may not be based on evidence at all. But you will have cases where it's a matter of who, who you believe. Do you believe our side or do you believe their side? And so when you're doing your assessment of risk in such a case at the outset, you have to work out how credible your witness is going to be. Now, Andy, you do witness familiarization. And there are really two aspects of this to you. First of all, What help can you provide at the outset in terms of that assessment of the credibility, how good the witness is going to be at trial? And secondly, what assurance can you give later on to make sure the witness comes up to proof? Yes, I think in terms of assessing the the witness and and the risk, I'll start by saying it's a a performance risk, not a a person risk. So you may have someone who you think is going to be and is well set up to be a good witness, but actually doesn't perform on the day or, or vice versa. So I'd describe it as a, as a performance risk. And I think in terms of assessing that, one of the biggest dangers is going too early in that assessment. So if you are assessing someone before they have even tried it, then there's going to be a lot of invalidity in terms of your, your assessment. If they have a better knowledge of the role of a witness then um, and have more practice at doing it, you can make a more valid um, assessment. And I think a lot of witnesses, to start with, it feels familiar. You're answering questions, you're speaking, you're doing something you do every day as a human. 
and so you think you can do it. But when you actually have an understanding of the role of a witness and the difference in that role, then um, you start to perform differently. And I think understanding how well people can um, understand and stick to a different role and understanding how they'll deal with the pressure is going to help you make a more valid assessment of how they're going to perform on the day. And David, as a litigator, what do you think about, about your witnesses when they're going to be potentially key at the outset of a case? Well, I think obviously we have probably more contact to begin with with that individual person. And so we're able to form an initial assessment. Um, we typically go through a stage of proofing a witness where we get all the information that they can recall. That's before you even consider preparing a statement. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that you know, witnesses are human beings. You know, litigation is inherently stressful. And um, how they perform in the box is going to be different from how good a person they are within an organization and fulfilling a different role. So um, you have to take that into account. And I always think that some of the best witnesses are the witnesses that don't view their role as trying to win the case for the company in which they're acting, but also they're just focused on the facts and you know, recalling to the best of their ability what they can remember. If they can't remember something, it might be appropriate for them to make a concession. That's absolutely fine. But those that get drawn into you know, arguing the case or thinking that they are the star and they are you know, going to unlock the case for the company is, is a dangerous area to be in. So I think it's about managing that and also not putting too much pressure on the individual concerns so they don't feel that that's what they have to do. Louis, the other great evidential uncertainty are documents. Um, and litigators live in fear of the terrible document emerging which defeats the case. Alternatively, they live in hope of finding the brilliant document that wins the case. Not many cases are like that, but it can happen. If you're looking at day one, client walks through the door uh, as a complicated matter, uh, and uh, very likely that the outcome will be significantly affected by what's in the documents. How do you start thinking about that? Well, the first thing that the client, I think, will want us to think about is the costs risk associated with the documents. You know, lawyers are increasingly dealing with an awful lot of unstructured data in vast volumes. And so one of the things we need to work out from the outset is how best to interrogate that data in a time and cost efficient way. And increasingly, lawyers are using technology to help them to do that, to achieve those efficiencies and to hopefully find the smoking gun if there is one at the start, rather than later down the line when you're in disclosure or worse still, when the witness is already giving evidence in the stand. So. Uh, cost risk is obviously an important one. There will be a balance to be struck. There will be some cases, as you say, Dan, where actually doing a massive document investigation exercise at the outset is simply uneconomic and disproportionate to the matters in issue. But there will be other cases, you know, big fraud cases, for example, where the very nature of the claim hinges upon whether something happened or not and whether someone said something or wrote something or not. And in those cases, it definitely is warranted that an investigation is undertaken because it's our duty to help us advise the client on the risks, who said what, how, how did it happen, you know, where are the connections, and there is technology out there to help us with that, but ultimately it's down to the lawyers to advise the client on what the best process is and what the outcome is, hopefully, um, that, that you hope to obtain as a result of those investigations. And another area of uncertainty, Louise, over and above evidence, is sometimes there can be a legal uncertainty, you may have a legal provision where you don't know what a piece of statute says or where uh, the common law is developing in some area, so there can be legal uncertainty. And there's also a sort of problem with the judge. You don't quite know how the judge is going to make it, uh, and uh, there may be issues of judges exercising discretion, how they interpret the law, how they interpret the evidence. So sort of put that under a, a degree of legal uncertainty together. Again, at the outset of the case, how do you think about that? Well, I'd say at the outset of the case, the sort of legal uncertainty is probably playing on your mind more than the judge. We can, we can come on to that because that obviously comes to play into play a lot later. Um, the legal uncertainty is one that, you know, we constantly grapple with, with clients. There could be an easy answer if there's a contractual dispute, either there's a breach of contract or there isn't. Um, but unfortunately, in the sort of larger, more complex cases that we deal with, it's often not as simple as that. And you have to advise the client, well, the clause could be interpreted this way or there's another interpretation. And we're obliged to think through those options and work out which of the arguments we would prefer um, and which a judge would prefer if you end up in trial. Um, 
There are other, as you mentioned, Dan, there are other aspects that might add to that uncertainty. So there might be new statutes, new law that comes into play that might feed into your, your thinking on how something might be interpreted. Case law might itself mean that your, the judge is more likely to view a particular clause one way or the other. We saw an example of that, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic when you know, force majeure clauses and the law of frustration really came under the spotlight from judges and actually case law developed in a way that perhaps no one could have predicted. Um, where judges were desperately trying to find the right outcome um, using the words that were on the page that perhaps hadn't even been thought about by the parties when they actually entered into the contract. So there's that element of legal uncertainty that you have to keep under review, frankly, as the case progresses. And then as you get towards trial, um, minds perhaps do turn to you know the judge. Who's the judge going to be that will assess the case? Is there any way we can influence that or predict how that outcome might, might happen? Um, and there are a couple of things I can say on that. I mean, the first thing I think is the most obvious one, which is it's very difficult to predict how, you know, or indeed influence how a judge is going to make a decision. Obviously, you will have your arguments and you will hope that at trial you put your best arguments forward. Um, the decision you make at the outset about which court you launch your proceedings in might have an impact. So, for example, if you want a particular specialist judge to hear a media claim or a business claim, um, you might choose which court you, you issue your claim in in the first place. But then, to be honest, it'll come down to the judge on the day. You'll only know the judge 24 hours in advance normally. So there's very little you can do to actually influence the judge who's going to hear your case. If it's a matter of expertise that you're worried about, obviously our judiciary are extremely um, uh, able, both technically and obviously um, to, uh, in relation to the law, but they might need an expert to help them with technical aspects that they might not otherwise necessarily understand straight away. So we can talk a bit more perhaps about expert witnesses and, and the additional risks that they might bring into the litigation. Another option, if um, at the outset you think your dispute might be technical rather than legal, is to think about, well, how do you want your dispute to be resolved in the first place? You might not want to go to court and go to a judge. You might want to appoint a more technically um, specialist arbitrator, for example. So you might want to go to arbitration to have your dispute heard rather than to court. Or alternatively, for certain you know, post-M&A um, disputes, for example, we often have expert determination clauses where actually you don't go to court or arbitration at all. And you go through a, a separate expert determination process to really resolve those kind of technical issues that might otherwise prove to be an additional element of risk in litigation. So lots of aspects, particularly in terms of forum, which affect and which you can use to manage the risk uh, at the outset. Now, to a law student, perhaps to a judge, that may seem the encapsulation of risk in litigation when you've looked at the evidence and you've looked at the legal uncertainty. But of course, to practitioners, it's not as simple as that. And there are two other factors, uh, because uh, clients turn out, turn out to be much more concerned with outcomes than they are with judgments. And the first one of those is the enforcement uh, of it. It's all well and good getting a fantastic order from the court, giving you everything you want. But if you can't enforce it, that's of limited use. David, tell me about the problems with enforcement and how you'd assess those at the outset. So I think you need to assess them at a really early stage. It's probably one of the first issues that particularly people like Harshi were looking at because um, you know, people tend to think that a judgment in your favour is the outcome that you want, it's success. But actually, as you say, Dan, if you can't enforce that, then the judgment's potentially worthless. So if I'm in a claimant position, I'm looking at you know, where are the defendant's assets? Have they got the means to potentially pay out? And that can involve quite a lot of work, particularly if you know, they're an international organisation with lots of you know, interests and assets abroad. And you want to be able to undertake a degree of due diligence to show that there's you know, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow so that you're not, frankly, wasting your time. Um, and also it feeds into decisions that you might make as to you know, how you start a claim. Because if you've got, for example, an option, as some contracts do, to either, for example, commence a claim in the English High Court or arbitration, you're going to want to understand, well, if I get an English judgment, is that going to be enforceable reciprocally in a jurisdiction in which the assets are located? So that's a question because you don't want to start again in a different jurisdiction from scratch. And it might be that arbitration is a potential way forward because you've got the New York Convention in place where there's over 170 um, signatories around the world which can make it a bit easier sometimes to enforce. So I think the key message is to look at it really early up front. Um, Harshif will have a view as well on this, but just to get a picture, because if there's no assets, <coughs> then it's going to you know, dynamically change the, the outcome potentially uh, for the worse. Indeed, Harshif, I mean, what, what, uh, uh, how much do you factor in the ability to enforce 
a successful judgment uh, in your assessment of risk when you take a case on? Sure, I mean, it's, it's absolutely crucial to being able to take a case on um, from early on. So really, there are, there are two aspects to this. One, where we're funding a claim, and then we're looking at enforcement as part of the overall risk. There are also uh, uh, funding, there, there's also funding of pure enforcement actions or purchasing of awards <coughs> where we might be undertaking pure enforcement. That's a completely separate risk where we're, we're assessing the risk of enforcement, going through all the factors that David mentioned to be able to understand whether we should take on a risk and we think there are, there are sufficiently high prospects to actually take on a pure enforcement action. Um, when we're looking at taking on a piece of litigation from, let's say, day one, as, as Ed mentioned, likely before defense has even been served, we'll be looking at the enforcement piece to be generally quite binary again. So, you know, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd need enforcement to be uh, comfortable. Of course, there's enforcement risk with, with any company or any individual that you're litigating against, but we'd, we'd like enforcement to be um, a, f a fairly non-consideration at that point. And, and I think that would be common across, m across most funders. If, you, um, look, if you're looking at pure enforcement, then we're looking at that as a completely separate risk and the legal risks that, that are associated with that, such as David mentioned, enforcing in jurisdictions in which the country may have, uh, <coughs> uh, enforcing in jurisdictions in which the defendant may have assets and the ability to enforce the time, the costs, et cetera, and all the other factors that go into assessing whether we might be able to enforce that uh, judgment or award successfully. And the, the other factor uh, which practitioners are very alive to is settlement. Um, settlement can be a very quick way of getting what you want in, in litigation and uh, uh, can be very suitable. How would you assess, David, uh, the, the, uh, the, the risk factor of settlement? How does that affect the risk of litigation when you're looking <laughs> at the case at the outset? Well, well, most cases, Dan, most cases do settle um, statistically. More, more cases settle than end up going to trial. And that's um, predominantly because the ultimate way to... <coughs> mitigate risk in a dispute is to um, seek to resolve it through a settlement outcome because you're taking the decision making process out of the hands of a third party such as a judge uh, or an arbitral tribunal and you're determining the terms upon which you're settling um, and you need to look at that at a really early stage to look at your appetite for risk to set your settlement strategy and I think um, it's important that people bear that in mind because um, settlement is also litigation is just a means to an end. It's not the end in and of itself. And people sometimes forget that. And you always want to keep the door open for settlement throughout the process um, and keep that under review as parties you know, change their position. So I think it's really important that you have a strategy at the beginning. And that strategy, for my part, needs to focus on you know, what is essential to me, what is essential to the other side, what are their motivations, what are their interests, um, what um, is the uh, worst case scenario, what are the, the red lines that are perceived or actual that you, know, you maybe can't cross, what's the bottom line, and what's uh, going to happen if you can't settle? So what's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement or the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement, a BATNA or whatnot? So the, you need to take into account all of those things and then look, as, as Harshid was saying, about other factors such as the opportunity cost of litigation in terms of management time, the actual cost, uh, and certain things um, such as those, uh, and, and looking at reputation as well, which is obviously very important. <coughs> and Ajiv, in terms of when you're assessing cases at the outset, um, how do you factor in the possibility of settlement? Sure, uh, look, it's, 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 it's again a crucial element to, uh, to be able to um, assess the possibility of settlement early on. We're looking at the psychology of the claimant, the psychology of the defendant, if the claimant, um, it, 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 if, if the issue in dispute is so important to the claimant that they want their day in court, as it were. That's a, that's a really big red flag, of course. You know, we, we'd, we'd like every claim to be able to settle, just as Ed, Ed mentioned. Um, we also have to look at how our funding economics might impact the likelihood of settlement. For example, if we provide a certain amount of capital um, on day one um, and beyond to, to, to then um, allow the claim to continue, but we're asking for our money back plus a multiple of that money or taking a percentage of the overall award, does that then make the claim unsettleable at amounts that it might be able to settle for today? Um, and therefore, are we not doing the claimants any favours by <coughs> providing funding for them and um, only pushing the boat further out uh, from, from where it might currently be? So we look at the economic factors, we look at the psychological factors, we have to look at um, uh, the, the the asset positions of, of the other sides and their ability to, to, to settle, of course, and, and you know whether they will be able to, to pay out certain sums on, on day one or whether there will be uh, 
uh, stage payments, etc. So all sorts of um, commercial and legal considerations go into whether we think we should take on a claim based on whether it might be able to settle or not. And it sounds like it also informs the way you structure your funding arrangement because you don't want to structure it in a way which is going to reduce the possibility of settlement. No, ab absolutely not. Um, if, there, if there is a possibility to settle a claim um, early or partway through the litigation, taking into account key inflection points such as um, uh, disclosure or, or, or witness evidence or, or really early stage matters such as uh, pre-action disclosure or, or inception of ATE insurance, which might have a, a significant cost of a premium, all of those things will play into when we think settlement might happen and we'll do our best to model where we think those inflection points might be. Of course, it's largely guesstimation work on day one uh, with the information provided by lawyers and clients, but we're trying to do our best to predict the life cycle of, a, of an actual claim. So we've seen, having regard to those five factors and there may be other factors, there is the possibility of having a more methodical approach to risk assessment by lawyers than just the KC saying 60% finger in the air uh, and a great deal of analysis. And I think that's a, a, an area we're very much uh, moving to. Looking a bit more at the computation of risk, and particularly when you're weighing up different options in litigation, there's something called the, the Monte Carlo method, David. Do you want to explain what that is and how you may go about a, a rather more mathematical approach to looking at litigation? Sure. So um, there's a whole degree of um, theory about uh, litigation and advanced um, modelling outcomes. And this is where you take a, a slightly more mathematical approach to evaluating options uh, that are under uh, dispute. And a Monte Carlo analysis is essentially taking um, a series of data points, plotting them on a probabilistic curve, using um, machines and computers to run um, simulations. And I think it was pioneered back in the uh, 1950s by uh, a chap called um, Ed Thorpe, who used it principally in relation to trying to win at uh, blackjack because he wanted to uh, you know, get as much money as possible. He was a poor student back then. Uh, and he devised a tool using an IBM computer to do this. And it was so successful that he went into Las Vegas and he won loads of money and they banned him from the casinos and said, you don't ever come back. Um, uh, but you can use it today uh, in litigation analysis because you can take a series of data inputs, you can plot them on that curve that I mentioned, and it gives you a defined potential range of outcomes. And um, you know, it runs over thousands and thousands of trials, and it's quite often useful for um, analysis where you need to value certain assets. So it might be a dispute about the valuation of a company or its shares. Uh, experts use it quite often and if you're ahead of the curve you can use it yourself before you even get to that stage to give you that real you know high level informed um, assessment which I think is actually really important for the most complex of matters. And Ajiv, do you uh, use these kinds of probabilistic tools to assess options in litigation, looking at the various costs, probabilistic outcomes, is that a way that guides you through the, the most commercial outcome? Yes to a degree in derivations of. Um, the reality is we're funding a claim where, and you know, it, it, it largely depends on the data inputs that David was mentioning, and there are so many different data inputs that, that can throw the model off one way or another, and uh, we try and model for what we think are the, are the, are the boundaries. Um, but really, it comes down to, you, you, you can throw as many data points and number, numerical data points into, into spreadsheets and into um, uh, models, but we ultimately come down to do we think the claimant, we go back to those core questions, do we think the claimant and defendant are, have, a, have a mutual ground to be able to settle the claim? Do we think we're going to win at trial? Mm -hmm. Do we think we're going to be able to enforce our claims? All of those things are, are binary questions that, that we as uh, an investment committee and humans sit around and uh, sit around the table and decide whether we take a claim forward. So yes, those, those data points absolutely feed into our decision making and we, um, we, we, we do our absolute best to use them on all claims, but ultimately each individual claim is decided on its individual merits. So thank you for that. The, um, the, we looked at uh, litigation in a fairly brutal risk probabilistic way, but often litigation is more than that. It has psychological aspects for the clients. And I just wanted to pick up another extract from one of our videos. One factor that can significantly complicate litigation can be the psychological factor. What, by the time people even contemplate litigation, emotions can be very high 
and that is only exacerbated during the course of litigation generally. Studies have shown that when you have sort of intense negative feelings, it, it impacts quite significantly on your ability to, to take decisions. And particularly where people are angry or feel very aggrieved, that can impact on their ability to take rational choices, really balancing the cost benefit analysis that we would hope would run throughout litigation to make sure that you were achieving your objective. As a litigator, we try to address the psychological factors that can impact on decision making in um, litigation by taking a step back and ensuring that from the outset, with the client, we work to identify what their overriding objectives are in the litigation. Remember, in litigation, it's very rare that actually what you want is a victory before the court. What you want is success in terms of an outcome to the litigation that you are satisfied with. And actually rarely is that to do with the judgment. It may much more be to do with the terms of a settlement that can be reached with the other party. So taking that step back, looking at what the overriding objectives are and designing a strategy around that. And our role is to try and feed in all of the different risk aspects to make sure that there can be rational decision making rather than emotive decision making. And that might include acting as a sounding board for practical ideas that the client will look into for the purposes of resolving the dispute. So whether your litigation uh, client is an individual or a corporate, they're going to be represented by individuals. Uh, and those individuals will have instincts, they'll have emotions, and they may not always reflect entirely uh, the, uh, the, the best interests uh, of the party litigating in that way. So Andy, when you have that situation, people are involved, the blood is up. What advice would you give so we can cut through that and people concentrate on what their genuine interests are? Yeah, I, I think, as you say, you've got a human being going into a high stakes, high pressure environment, and that's going to be unpredictable by nature. Everyone is going to get a response, an emotional response to that situation. And it's about how you deal with that response, how you respond to, um, to, to how you're feeling in that moment. And I think that the, the first thing is um, we, we like to think that we are logical, rational human beings that make nice, clear decisions based on the facts in front of us. But of course we're not. We're, we're emotional beings. We make decisions based on how we're feeling. And how we're feeling impacts how we're thinking, and how we're thinking impacts how we behave. So if we don't start at that emotional end, we, we're going to end up there anyway, but in a negative way. So I think firstly exploring how people are feeling. And maybe there is a bit, because as you say, they're individuals going into the box. They may have um, very deep connections to the matters in hand and the fact in hand. And it might be that it, for them individually, the outcome they want it's not just financial, there is actually about telling their story and getting that out there. And if you don't address that, and if you don't talk to them about that, then that's what that's going to happen. I can remember training one witness who, um, and it was in a family case, and we trained her before the financial proceedings, and then we trained her again after that before the children's proceedings. And, she said, and we asked her how it went, and she said, well, I didn't do anything you said, but I said what I wanted to say, and I had my day in court, and I'm happy with that. And you kind of can't argue with that. If that's what her objective was, that was what her objective was. Um, so I think the worst thing you can do is ignore those emotions, um, and the best thing you can do is acknowledge them, build their awareness, and help build the objective they want to get from that. Because if, if you don't acknowledge it, it can get in the way, and it can cause problems further down the line. And Louise, as a litigation practitioner, how do you engage with the psychological aspect? Is the psychological aspect an adjunct or an obstruction to an assessment of risk? I think it's, prob it's probably both. Um, I mean, as, as Tamsin was alluding to in her video, it also depends on the type of case as well as to how significant that, that risk is. You know, in a reputation management case where the reputation of companies and sometimes even individuals is on the line, of course, emotions are going to run high and the extent to which the people 
uh, are feeling wronged um, and the people that are feeling wronged are the witnesses um, is going to change how you run that case and strategically what, what you might, for example, want each witness to do within their statement um, and try and sort of mitigate the risks that they start getting <coughs> cross-examined on issues that aren't strictly relevant to them. Um, in other cases, it might play a, a lesser role. It might simply be adjunct as opposed to um, a, 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 an issue um, that you have to grapple with because, frankly, it might just depend on the documents. Um, you know, there might just be, it might just be questions of fact or law that are primarily in front of the judge and not questions that give rise to the sort of emotive issues um, that might otherwise come about in sort of reputation management fraud conspiracy type cases. Um, and maybe it's something we've slightly covered, but I'd like to look at a little bit more is the use of technology to assess risk, to mitigate risk. Um, we continually live through a world of extraordinary technological advancements and it's coming to litigation more and more. What are, the litigate, what are the technological tools available now to assess risk and to mitigate risk? Well, David's already mentioned a couple of um, sort of the mathematical tools that might be used to kind of interrogate the data and come out with a kind of predicted outcome of sorts. Um, we obviously have other tools that are at our disposal depending on the stage of the case that you're at, for example. So at the start of the case, you'll be gathering information, gathering data in. You'll have lots of investigation tools at our disposal, both to forensically capture that data, but also then to interrogate it um, and to review it in a way that gives you an idea of where you might head next in your strategy. So, for example, we have software that, that visualises, you know, who was talking to who at what time. Um, who the connections might be that mean that you might point you towards specific people that you might want to prove, for example, as potential witnesses. Um, what happened at what date? What are there patterns in the data that mean that you should start thinking, well, hold on, certainly for things like fraud cases that I've mentioned, you know, hold on, what was happening at what time? Is what we're being told in our initial proofing sessions borne out by the documents that we have in front of us. So there's those kind of data interrogation tools that are available to us that might help us both at the outset, but then also to refine what we're doing um, as we go through the exercise. Obviously, as you get nearer to trial, you have disclosure, for example. Increasingly, courts are requiring us to use what's called TAR, Technology Assisted Review, to help in the, in the interrogation and disclosure of relevant data. And that's something that we are increasingly dealing with in terms of you know, predictive coding, getting the machine to, to sort of promote the documents that it thinks are most likely to be relevant so that the lawyers don't have to waste time reviewing clearly irrelevant documents. They can focus on those that are most likely to help in that assessment of risk going forward. And finally, uh, in terms of mitigating risk, the insurance products which are available. So uh, I am um, a defendant in a major piece of litigation, or maybe I'm a claimant, and I come to you wanting to know what insurance products are there that will protect me. What, what are the range of products which are available these days? Well, the, the market's evolving quite quickly at the moment, partly driven by the influx of litigation funders into the market. And so it's seen the um, last four or five years a lot of creativity coming from the sector. The, the most sort of standard policy which we, we do is just to cover off the adverse cost risk in uh, litigation. So the lawyers will advise that there's a liability for, say, £2 million if the case is unsuccessful. And rather than having to make an accounting provision for that amount on your balance sheet, you instead take out an insurance policy which pays in those circumstances. Where things have got more um, interesting, perhaps, is people looking at litigation as either a liability or an asset and creating these new types of policies to work in those uh, circumstances. So for example, earlier we talked about the enforcement risk and what advice can you give to your client at the outset of the case? Well, insurers have started to um, provide products which can cover against that liability. So for example, if you're suing a sovereign state, you can get insurance to cover the default of the sovereign state. Or if you were suing a large corporate, you can also take insurance to cover the eventuality that you do have an award and you can't enforce it, or even before the award has been uh, given. There's other products which are out there as well, which allow you to, for example, cover your own legal expenditure in the course of litigation. So what the industry is, is trying to do is to make it a bit easier from a, an accounting perspective and a, you know, financial control perspective to say, look, if we are going to embark on this journey of litigation, we can give some certainty as to what it's going to cost at the out, uh, you know, regardless of the outcome of the, uh, of the case. And I'll ask you the impossible question, but to what extent are the premiums of those recoverable as costs? 
Uh, the position has changed, unfortunately. Uh, it used to be very easy to recover your premiums into partes. Um, there are a few limited exceptions to the rule now, but by and large, that's that's not something you can do. But I think where you know where people are looking at this is is if you have an accounting situation where, in effect, you're going to have to make provision for four or five years of what could potentially be very hard fought litigation, you might have a legal budget from your own lawyers of several million. You might have a adverse cost liability or something similar. How do you do that from an accounting perspective without having you know, some kind of mitigation um, instrument which you can use and, re and rely on? And, and the market has become much more sophisticated recently. Lots of new entrants into the market. And there's a, you know, um, uh, household name insurance companies who are now coming into the market to provide these kind of products. Thank you. Well, now I was just going to turn to some um, questions from the audience. And first, we'll start with Georgie. Um, anticipate AI affecting our ability to assess risk in litigation? Can you give us that? Yes, well, I've alluded already to the sort of technology that we already have at our fingertips available for kind of crunching that unstructured data. And that's more the sort of machine learning aspect of AI that people are beginning to become quite familiar with. Obviously, what people are now looking at is the generative AI and things like chat GPT and then the ways that that might help lawyers and the legal profession generally, not, 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 not just assessing risk in litigation. And I think the, the honest answer is it will undoubtedly help um, and it will undoubtedly be part of what we do going forward. But I think lawyers are going to have to get quite familiar with not just the, the sort of proficiencies and the capabilities of generative AI, but also the risks associated with it and how we should be using it properly um, in a way that gives us the right outcome. Because what you've got to remember at the moment is how you know, chat GPT and other generative AI operates is you train it, you give it data, it then, you then give it a prompt and then it produces an output. And it's a human-like output, but it's not human. So it's very reliant on the data being put in as to the outcome that you, that you receive and the prompt that you give it as well. So any kind of inherent bias, for example, in the data that you're putting in or the prompt that you're giving it will be reflected in the outcome, um, which obviously you don't want if you're trying to ob obtain a kind of very objective assessment of risk. So, you know, CMS, as I'm sure other law firms and, and providers are, are looking at how AI will help them and make their, you know, client service more efficient um, and more um, targeted. But at the same time, I think we have some way to go before AI becomes kind of mainstream and certainly becomes the only thing that, um, that both lawyers and clients can rely on in, in assessing this kind of risk. Thank you. And got another one from James. Hi there. Um, should risk in litigation always be perceived as negative, or can it sometimes be advantageous? David, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. Often, as lawyers, we think um, quite conservatively. We think about risk, and we attribute negative things to that. But I think for people in different spheres, they look at risk uh, also in a positive way, particularly in the context of a, uh, an approach to settlement. It's a bit like um, playing poker in some respects, because you're trying to get the best possible outcome, maximise your returns based on incomplete information uh, and make educated guesses about how the other side are potentially going to respond. Um, and so it can be positive. Obviously, you can't change the overall you know, value of the claim. But in the context of a negotiation where you're looking at trying to influence the outcome, uh, I think you need to bear in mind that you know, risk has its positive attributes as well. And I, and I guess from a funding perspective as well, whilst you, know, you want you know, legal certainty and good prospects in relation to the legal arguments. You want your lawyers to be, you know, fighting hard to get the best possible outcome. And that may you know, involve a degree of, you know, bluff and, you know, playing the game well. It's a game of chance, as I think we know. And if you look at it through that sort of slightly mathematical approach and not traditionally the, the, the adverse risk, then you can get potentially a better outcome. I think we've got time just for one more uh, question. Shraf, do you want to... Just on settlement of disputes, might it be perceived as weak to be the first party to propose settlement? David, you were talking about settlement before. Um, I think traditionally it definitely used to be thought of in that way. It's rather old fashioned to think, well, if you're the party that's proposing a settlement discussion, that must mean you don't have confidence in your case. That's certainly not how um, judges look at matters. We're encouraged now to engage at an early stage pre-action before a dispute has even been issued to try to resolve it. Uh, and of course, just because you uh, go first and, and talk about settlement, it doesn't mean that you don't have confidence in your case. And there have been lots of studies 
through Harvard and the like, where actually it's been shown that you can get a better outcome, potentially if you go first and if you anchor the negotiations around what you want. So I think um, you need to be mindful of that. And also, I, I imagine from a funding perspective, um, you, know, you don't want your lawyers um, digging in and just taking the most aggressive approach because, again, from a sort of uh, modelling game theory type perspective, um, if parties you know, both take an aggressive approach, that tends to push the settlement discussion to later in the process, by which point more costs have been incurred and that can sometimes make it a bit harder to settle. Point as well, I think there are probably some cultural elements to settlement as well, which you have to be mindful of as, as legal advisors. You know, um, in, in some cultures, making that first move might be perceived as a weakness, so we have to work to, to navigate that that kind of cultural element. But but coming back to what David was saying earlier, I mean, settlement is the ultimate mitigation tool, in particular in disputes where getting a court judgment might not actually fix everything that the client wants. Um, you know, Tamsin in her video alluded to the fact that actually. You know, a lot of clients don't go into litigation wanting their day in court. They want some kind of outcome that resolves all the loose ends that they have to tie up. And actually, in quite a lot of instances, a court judgment isn't going to tie up all those loose ends. You know, I've had cases where there's been a court proceedings, there's been two arbitrations. There's also been some commercial elements to the dispute that none of those were capable of resolving. And the only <coughs> way of resolving them was by getting the parties to sit down and discuss in a, in a kind of um, sort of not necessarily a formal mediation, but just a kind of negotiated commercial outcome that is nothing to do with, uh, you know, the, the sort of traditional litigation risk that we've just been talking about in terms of your day in court. Well, thank you, everybody. I think we're coming to time. And so it just leaves me to thank our panel for those uh, very helpful insights, particularly our guests. Very grateful for them coming uh, and, uh, uh, and providing uh, their views. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed uh, today and found that useful. I hope you'll join in next year when we do another in dispute, uh, looking at another area uh, of litigation. Um, next up uh, for us, uh, we have the Media Litigation Toolkit, where we'll be doing some webinars looking at all aspects of media litigation at the end of this month. Um, we would hope that you'd fill in the feedback forms, uh, which are available on your console. Uh, and uh, finally, as I say, thank you very much to everybody here and at home who's uh, joined us today. Thank you.